Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I think um, I think we've waited long enough now. Maybe we might uh, um, get started. Um, so um, before we start, I should I would like to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land um, where I am, which coincides with uh, that of UNSW's Sydney campus, uh, the uh, the Bejigal people. Uh, and if you know the con traditional custodians of the land where you are, please feel free to enter that into the chat. That's sometimes nice to see. Um, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I would like to extend those respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present with us today. Um, and with that, uh, uh, yes, as I said, we had a bit of a lockdown induced break. We're back now. We've got a, uh, we've got a, a schedule of talks running up to uh, uh, Christmas. And actually we've got some booked beyond that as well. So uh, they'll be appearing on the website. So please feel free to go on and have a look at those. Um, today, uh, we, uh, we're lucky enough that we have um, Ricard Alert Zenon, who is um, a newly minted group leader uh, jointly between the Max Planck Institute for Complex Systems and the Center for Systems Biology in Dresden. Um, I think I think Ricardo was saying two days. In fact, two days. Two it's two days into into, yes. the, into the position. Um, and um, before that, Ricardo was a HFSP postdoc at Princeton. Uh, and uh, before that, uh, he did his PhD at the University of Barcelona under uh, Jaume Casamund Casademunt, excuse me. Uh, um, and um, and so. I, I'll, I should shut up and I would love to pass over to Ricardo. He's going to talk about active fluids, topological defects, turbulence and phase separation. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me uh, to give this webinar. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and so, as uh, Richard said, I've just started my uh, own group at the Max Planck Institute for Complex Systems and the Center for Systems Biology in Dresden. But what I want to tell you about today is actually work that I did during uh, my postdoc in, in Princeton. Um, so this was uh, in the Princeton Center for Theoretical Science. And what I want to discuss today is um, three aspects of the physics of active fluids. And the three aspects that I would like to discuss are first, topological defects, second, turbulence, and third, phase separation. And so as a broad introduction to this topic, what I would like to say is that you know in, in biology, there are many collective phenomena in a variety of systems that happen across a vast range of scales. And so there's uh, three examples here. Um, the, the example on the left is a, a single cell that is migrating on a substrate, and it does so by the collective action of its intracellular components. And so this is a collective process, a collective phenomenon uh, that happens over scales of, say, uh, a few microns. Now, what you see in the center is rather the collective migration of many, many cells, that spread cohesively as a tissue on the substrate. And so the, this is yet another collective phenomenon. And this one happens over scales of hundreds of microns and up to millimeters in size, okay, much larger scales. And then finally on the right, what you see is the collective motion of sheep um, in a herd. And, and that's yet another type of you know, collective phenomenon, but this one happens at scales of tens of meters. And so one, one important question in the field is whether despite the enormous differences between all of these uh, systems, there are any organizing principles that can help us understand what's common between them. And so one possible answer to this question is that in fact, all of the systems are what we call active fluids in the sense that they are made by components that can use uh, energy from the environment or from their own to uh, move on their own. And so this allows this sort of fluids to um, flow spontaneously without having to drive them with external forces. And so what I want to discuss today is, as I said, three different aspects of the, of the fascinating physics of these active fluids. And so um, the talk will have three parts. In the first one, um, I will discuss the role of topological defect in bacterial colonies. Then in the second part, I'll uh, discuss the emergence of scaling laws in active turbulence, which is turbulence in active fluids. And then in the, in the third part of the talk, I'll discuss a new mechanism for phase separation in active fluids. Um, and so let me start with the first part. And so this was actually work together with uh, our experimental collaborators, Katie Copenhagen, uh, who is a postdoc in the lab of Josh Shavitz at Princeton. And I did the theory together with Ned Wingreen also at Princeton. So I wanted to start this part by showing you a movie. 
Um, it's a movie of two bacterial colonies. What you see on the left is a, a colony of a soil bacterium known as Myxococcus xanthus, and I will refer to it simply as Myxo from now on. And what these Myxobacteria are doing is they are collectively spreading on the substrate, and in particular, they are, they are, they are migrating over this second colony here on the right-hand side. And this is a colony of E. coli. And what's happening here is that the Myxo cells are actually preying on the E. coli as they go. They are eating them. And in doing so, they are forming a number of collective behaviors, such as the ripples that you see here on the right-hand side. And then the mix of cells that are left behind without food form these sort of, um, you know, um, spots, okay, dark spots. And so that's precisely what I want to focus on today. And so the first thing that I want to show you is that these are not actually um, spots, but they are three-dimensional aggregates of cells that look like this. They look like little droplets. Um, each of which contains hundreds of thousands of individual bacterial cells. And these aggregates are known as fruiting bodies. And they are actually part of the developmental life cycle of these bacterial colonies. So let me tell you about it. Um, imagine that you get a few spores of, myxo of myxococcus, okay, of this bacterium. These spores are spherical cells. They are metabolically inactive. And so they can resist long periods of time without food, okay? They can survive starvation. Now, imagine that you give them a little bit of food, then what they will do is they will uh, transform from spherical cells into rod shaped cells in a process known as germination. And once they do that, then they will start migrating on surfaces collectively in a phase known as swarming, and they will prey on other bacteria, much in the way that I showed you in the, in the previous movie, okay? Now, once they start running out of food, out of nutrients, then they will start aggregating into very dense two-dimensional colonies. And from these dense two-dimensional aggregates, they will form these three-dimensional structures, which are the fruiting bodies that I was telling you about. Now, the interesting thing is that inside these fruiting bodies, the rod-shaped cells will go back into spores. They will again transform into spherical, um, metabolically inactive cells. And this will allow the colony to collectively resist starvation, okay? So this is a strategy that they follow. Now, what I want to discuss today is precisely this transition from two-dimensional aggregates to these three-dimensional cellular aggregates, to the fruiting bodies. And what was known about this transition is that, in fact, it happens one cell layer at a time. So here's a movie that shows that. What you see is a cell colony that initially has two cell layers. And then as time goes on and these bacteria starve, you will eventually see that at some point around here, there's a third layer of cells that appears. And now there are many th third layers of cells. And then eventually there's a fourth layer of cells and then a fifth one and then a sixth one. And progressively more and more layers are being added sequentially, one on top of the other, until eventually you get this massive three-dimensional mounds of bacteria that will develop into fruiting bodies. And so when we saw movies like this, our question was um, actually how do these cells manage to form a new cell layer in the first place? That's not obvious because these cells are very well attached to the underlying substrate. Uh, they are migrating on it. And um, they're not proliferating, they're, they're not growing, they are starving. Um, so how do they manage to build up the stresses to form a new cell layer? And so to answer this question, our experimental colleagues took very high resolution images of a single cell layer, and that's what they saw. Here, what you see is the individual cells, which as I said, are these rod-shaped objects. They are packed at a very high density, and so they align with one another. And so collectively, this bacterial colony forms a phase of matter with orientational order, which is what we call a liquid crystal, okay? So this is a bacterial liquid crystal. And of course, it's very different from the usual ones in the sense that the components of this, of this liquid crystal, which are the cells, are not just subject to random thermal fluctuations, but they are actively migrating on the underlying substrate. And so this is a realization of an active liquid crystal. Now, as in any liquid crystal, there are specific points um, in this material where the orientational order is locally lost. So these points are known as topological defects. Um, some of you may be familiar with them, and that's what I want to focus um, on next, okay? So here's a close-up view of the colony, and what we see is, again, the individual cells, and uh, the color code here indicates the axis along which cells are aligned, okay? The angle along which cells are aligned at each point in space. And what you can see is that this angle varies smoothly throughout space, except at two points, one point here and one point there. And so at these two points, all of the different colors meet, and therefore uh, the orientation of the cells at these points is not well-defined, right? These points are singularities of the angle field, and these are precisely what's known as topological defects. 
And so what I want to show you now is that the two defects that you see in this image are actually different from one another. If we look at the defect on the left first, what we see is an arrangement of cells like this. And this structure has a single axis of symmetry, which is the horizontal axis in this case, okay? Now, instead, if we look at the defect on the right-hand side, we see a different arrangement of cells, and it looks like this. It's something like this, which now has three axes of symmetry. This one, that one, and that one, okay? So these are two different structures, and a way of quantifying this difference is by looking at a quantity known as the topological charge. And so this is nothing but the winding number of the angle of cell alignment as we move in a closed loop around the core of the defect. Okay, so if we compute this winding number for a defect like the one on the left, what we get is a topological charge of plus one half. And so these defects are called plus one half defects. Instead, if we do it for the defect on the right hand side, then what we get is a topological charge of minus one half. And so these are going to be minus one half defects. And the way I will denote them in images is by placing a red dot at the core of plus one half defects and then a segment along their single axis of symmetry. Whereas for minus one half defects, what I will do is to place a blue dot at their core and then three segments along the three axes of symmetry that they have. And so what we then did was to identify and track these defects in the cell colony and see what they do. And so here's a movie that shows that. Um, what you see is that pairs of plus and minus one half defects are emerging in pairs. Um, then they are also annihilating in pairs and they generally flow with the cells. And the additional piece of information that you see in this movie is the color code, which stands for the height field in the cell colony. And so darker means taller. And this allows us to visualize where new cell layers form, how they move, and what they do in general. And so uh, by, by staring at movies like this, what we eventually realized is that there were events like the following. So here's a plus one half defect. And what you can see in these snapshots is, it, snapshots is that in a matter of just a few minutes, what you see is that there's a new cell layer that forms right at the position of this plus one half defect, okay? And this is very clearly seen if you look at the measured height field. You see this increase in height here. Now, instead, um, if we look at this minus one half defect here, um, this blue symbol, what we see is that over the same time scale, the, the cell monolayer actually tears itself apart. And there's a hole that opens up at the position of this minus one half defect. Okay, and again, this is very clearly reported in the height field. And so, of course, then what we wondered is, you know, how generic is this? Um, is it something that we just saw in these examples or is it something that happens generically? And so what we then did was to compute the probability that either a new layer or a new hole would appear at a given distance from a defect. Okay, and so here are the results. What you can see is that for new layers, it's about 100 times more likely that they will appear at a plus one half defect, then far away from the defect. The probability decays with distance, okay, to the defect. Now, instead, for new holes, what we found is that it's about 100 times more likely that they will appear at a minus one half defect, uh, the blue symbols, than far away from the defect, okay? Again, the probability decays with distance. So this is telling us that uh, new cell layers preferentially form at plus one half defects, and new holes tend to open up at minus one half defects. And so of course, then the question is why? And so to, to address this, what we did was to develop a theory that uh, treats the cell colony as an active uh, pneumatic liquid crystal. And the theory is actually based on a force balance. And it's a balance between frictional forces here on the left-hand side, which are proportional to the velocity at which cells move on top of the substrate. And then, active forces generated by cell migration on the right-hand side of the equation. And so what I will do is to first discuss the origin of the active forces, and then I'll discuss the friction forces. So um, to discuss the active forces, let's imagine that we're in a region of the system in which cells are perfectly aligned along a given axis, okay? This axis I will call N, and this is what's known as the director field in the physics of liquid crystals. And um, because cells are moving back and forth all the time along this axis of alignment, they are generating, they're pushing on their neighbors. And so they're generating stress in the material. And this stress is very anisotropic, okay? And so this very anisotropic active stress um, can be written um, in, in the form of a stress tensor, sigma A, which is proportional to another tensor Q. This other tensor Q is what's known as the pneumatic order parameter tensor, 
and um, it's it's constructed just by taking the tensor product of this director field n. Okay, so just by knowing the direction of this director field, we can build this tensor. And in 2D, in particular, you know, the this axis of alignment is just given by an by an angle. Okay, so that's how we build this active stress. And now, what's interesting is what happens if we slightly distort this perfect arrangement that I was telling you about into something like this. Okay, imagine that we do this um, little bit of distortion, and in this case, what we now wonder is what happens in an in a parcel of fluid like the one I just boxed. Now, in this case, what we have is that there's more stress on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side, and so the stress has now become uncompensated, and therefore there is a net force pushing on this um, um, parcel of fluid, and it's making it move toward the left. Okay, so this is precisely what these active forces are accounting for, and um, mathematically we can write it by saying that the active force is the divergence of the stress tensor. Okay, and so this is precisely what goes here on the right hand side of the equation. Now, how about the frictional forces? Well, the frictional forces, you know, the key thing to consider for the system is that axis like this, then perpendicular to the long axis like that. Okay, the second thing is much harder. And so to account for this fact, what we said is that this friction coefficient here um, is not just a scalar quantity, but it's actually a matrix with a part that accounts for the isotropic component of the friction. And then uh, a term here that accounts for how friction varies with the axis of cell alignment with the tensor Q. Okay, and epsilon here is the parameter that quantifies the friction anisotropy. Um, and so what we then did was to say, let's take this model, um, let's compute the active forces generated by the particular arrangements of cells around the topological defect, and then let's work out the flow field generated by these active forces around, def around defects. Um, and so here's what we found. What you see here is a plus one half defect. The solid lines here indicate the axis of alignment of cells at each point in space, and what you can see is that this axis of alignment is kind of converging into the core of the defect, okay? And this convergence means that there's a net pushing force on the defect that makes it move toward the left. And so this is indeed what you see in the predicted flow field here on the bottom. What you see is that all the little arrows point toward the left and defects like this would indeed move toward the left, okay? Now, the interesting thing is uh, what happens if we look at the color code in this image, which stands for the speed at which cells are moving. And so what we now see is that actually cells are moving faster behind the core of the defect here on the right hand side than in front of the core of the defect here on the left hand side. Okay, And this is actually a result of friction and isotropy, because if we think about it, cells are moving into the defect parallel to their alignment, Okay, like this here, but then they have to move out of the defect perpendicular to their alignment. And this is much harder. And so they will naturally move more slowly in front of the defect. Okay, and so this means that you know their cells move in fast, and then they have to move out slowly, so they become accumulated at the core of the defect, and uh, eventually these accumulating cells will have to be extruded to form a new cell layer. Okay, so this very simple theory is able to um, explain um, the experimental observation that new cell layers preferentially form at plus one half defects. Now, of course, we can do the same thing for minus one half defects, which are the ones that had three axes of symmetry in blue. And um, in this case, what the theory predicts is that there are three axes along which cells flow out of the core of the defect at a high speed. And then there are three axes along which cells flow into the core of the defect, but much more slowly, okay, at a, at a, at a smaller speed. And so this means that there's a net outflux of cells from these minus one half defects, and therefore cells are becoming depleted from these points. And eventually this will lead to the opening of a hole as we saw in the experiments, okay? So once we had these predictions and, and these explanations of the experiments, um, what we then did was to go back to our experimental colleagues and ask them to test these predictions in experiments. And so that's what they did. Um, Katie Copenhagen measured the flow fields in, in her experiments, and that's what she found. And this essentially confirms our, our predictions that there's a net influx of cells into plus one half defects, and this is, explains layer formation. And um, it also confirms the predictions for minus one half defects that there's this net outflux of cells from minus one half defects, and therefore this explains the opening of holes. Okay, so 
th this confirmed the theoretical picture. And um, that's all I wanted to say about this um, part of the talk. So I'll just summarize it by saying that what we found is that there are these very physical quantities like the orientational order of cells in this bacterial colony and the associated topological defects. And these um, facts um, combined with the active forces that cells generate as they migrate um, to explain how topological defects are seeds for the formation of new cell layers. And so these, I think, is interesting because um, it, it links um, very intimately the physics of active matter and topological defects to the biological function of this system, which is to form these new cell layers in order to build these massive fruiting bodies that will help the colony collectively respond to starvation. And so, um, you know, that's, I think, the, the main message um, of, of what we did. And so now, um, if there are any questions, maybe it's a good moment to pause for a second and take them. And um, otherwise, I can move to the second part of the talk. OK, um, so, yeah, so I actually forgot to mention that Ricardo said that there is a, is a sort of three is a talk in three acts. Uh, and yeah. so there's a there, there's a chance for questions. And actually, we've already got one here, Ricardo. I don't know if you can see the Q&A, but I'm going to read it out uh, for anybody who can't. Um, it's from uh, Anthony, and it says, what is the value of epsilon, like zero for isotropic dra drag on a cell and one for inclusion of an isotropy? Right. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually like this. So zero is for, you know, um, purely isotropic friction. One is the maximal um, possible anisotropy. And so what we did was to fit this parameter value to the experimental data. And what we got was values around 0.7 and 0.8. So, you know, quite, quite an isotropic friction. So, all right. Um, I should also just, I'll just say to anyone, anybody who, who wants to sort of quickly ask a question is, is more than welcome to just put in the q and I'd like to ask, ask a question and I'll just unmute them. Um, perhaps I might just ask a quick question if that's all right, Ricard. Uh, um, I'm just, I'm interested in two things, I suppose. Firstly, you would normally have a dynamical equation for Q. Right, with with viscosities, uh, um, do you just think that's negligible in this case, uh, or, or it's yeah, not good question. Relevant for the particular point you're making, right? So what we what we said is, um, you know, there's going to be some dynamics of Q of the orientational order, and what we did was to assume that this relaxes fast, much faster than the time scale of the flows, and so we were assuming that the defects are such that they already relax the free energy associated with. Um, the orientational order. So there's no dynamics of the orientational order anymore. And then the flows, the flows happen on a much longer time scale. Okay. And so my second question is also is about the layers themselves. When, when a second layer forms, how, how dynamical is the, is the texture of the sort of layer below it? Um, and, and can you see interesting things, you know, like, uh, like a, a sort of a, the formation of a three-dimensional texture? I mean, it, it seems like you have a very clear way of sort of, it, when you have a when you have a, a sort of plus half defect, you have a very clear way in which uh, the, the second layer will be orthogonal to the bottom layer, for example. Um, and it, right. did, did you look at that sort of, that, that kind of correlations of the textures across the different layers? Yes, excellent question. So that's, that's something that we're very interested in and we can't actually know for sure because you know, the system is not transparent and we can only look at it from the top. And so we only know what happens at the um, topmost layer. But what we suspect is the following. What we think is that, you know, once the cells um, form a new cell layer, the cells on the um, top layer actually fall in the ridges of the cells on the bottom. Okay. And this means, this we suspect from what we see at the boundaries between layers, because we see cells going in and out. So they, they clearly um, stay mobile in the bottom layer. The cells on the top also are able to move on the cells on the bottom layer. And so they are moving with respect to one another. And at the edges, we see them crawling past the cells on the top and, um, and they always are moving in the same direction. And so that's what makes us think that actually the cells on top are following falling in the ridges of the cells below, and therefore they are mimicking the exact same orientational pattern. And so it could well be that actually the upper layer inherits the topological defects of the bottom layer, and this allows the second layer to then build an additional layer on top and to have this process be sequential at a particular location in space. But that's something we, you know, it's so far suspicion, 
and we we don't have you know evidence for that. But that's that's interesting. Very nice. Uh, um, um, so there's actually no, now now there has appeared a second question. Um, I'm going to read it out as, as usual. Um, this is really fascinating work. You discussed the physics of the biological system. Did your group perform any fluorescence study by tagging membrane protein to know more about the layer formation? This is from Prasoon Aswapi. Right, uh, great question too. Uh, so no, we didn't. Um, and uh, what we know about it is that actually the cells um, interact with one another via membrane proteins. And so there's a, a signal that they exchange upon contact they don't interact over long distances. So there's nothing like chemotaxis or you know, any kind of secreted signaling, but they do um, communicate via contact. And so these involves membrane proteins like the ones you were mentioning, but we didn't discuss that. We didn't, we didn't study that. So there's, there's not much more than I can say about this. Okay, well, we should okay. uh, we'll let you carry on. Thanks okay, well. Thought. Yeah, thank you very much for, for the interesting question. So I'll, I'll now move to the second part of the talk, um, which is on um, the emergence of scaling laws in active turbulence. And so this is actually work with uh, Jean-Francois Joanny in Paris and with Jaume Casademunt in Barcelona. And so here the motivation was that um, in many, many different systems over, over time, people have observed in, in a number of biological fluids, flows that are chaotic that they have, you know, they have eddies and jets and things that are reminiscent of turbulence. Um, and this has been observed in a number of different systems, including bacterial suspensions, sperm, cytoskeletal suspensions made of, for example, microtubules and molecular motors, and even epithelial monolayers. And in all of these systems, you observe these flows that are chaotic. And this is surprising because all of these systems operate at very low Reynolds numbers. And so this means that inertial forces are um, completely negligible in front of um, viscous forces. And so we're in exactly the opposite limit as in traditional um, conventional um, turbulence, okay? And so the question of course is then uh, what, you know, what is this kind of motion? And, and so, you know, people gave it a name, it's, it's active turbulence. But the question is then what are the fundamental similarities and differences between this type of active turbulence and the traditional, um, you know, classical turbulence based on inertial forces, where the Reynolds number is high and inertia dominates over viscosity. And so what I want to do first is to actually tell you about two key concepts in the theory of classical inertial turbulence, so that I can then compare and contrast with what we found in active turbulence. And so um, I want to start from the Navier-Stokes equations, which are um, a balance between inertial forces here on the left-hand side, and then pressure gradients and viscous dissipative forces on the, on the right-hand side. And the two key concepts that I want to discuss are um, first, the notion of an energy cascade. And so this is something that uh, arises from the nonlinearity of the Navier-Stokes equations. And it can be understood as, as follows. Imagine that you're driving your car in the highway and by doing so, you're injecting air, uh, energy into the surrounding air, okay? And you're generating vortices in the air and the size of these vortices is comparable to the size of your own car, okay? So that's what I call this injection of energy into the fluid. Now, at this large scale in which I'm generating vortices, as I said, you know, the Reynolds number is very high, so uh, inertia dominates over viscosity and the energy that you injected cannot be dissipated by viscosity. And so it has to be transferred to other scales. And so what will happen in 3D is that these large vortices will split into smaller and smaller vortices sequentially until eventually you reach such small vortices and you've transferred all of the energy to these small vortices. And then the small vortices are small enough that dissipation now becomes important. The Reynolds is not large anymore. And, and then you dissipate the energy that you had injected at the large scale. Okay, so this process of injecting energy on some scale and then dissipating it at a, at, a, at a very, very different scale is what we call this energy cascade, okay, and the, the transfer of energy from, say, large to small scales or, or the opposite. Um, and so that's the first key notion in the theory of turbulence, and it goes back to uh, Louis Fry Richardson in 1922. And then uh, the second key notion in, in turbulence is the notion of a universal scaling law. And so this was actually predicted by Kolmogorov in 1941, uh, when he uh, predicted that the spectrum, the energy spectrum of uh, 
um, turbulent flows. So if you look at the spectrum of the kinetic energy as a function of the wave number, which is the inverse of the length scale, um, what we see is that, you know, you were injecting energy here at some large scale, dissipating it here at some small scale. And in between, there's a range of scales called the inertial range. And Kolmogorov predicted that the energy spectrum in this range of scales follows a power law of the wave number. And this power law has a universal exponent, which is minus five thirds. And it's universal in the sense that it's independent of the way we drive the flows. You know, this applies for, you know, your car, a bike, you know, um, airplanes. Um, it's independent of the driving. And it's also independent of uh, the properties of the fluid, such as its viscosity, okay? It applies to water, to air, to any kind of fluid that is exhibiting classical turbulence. And so this is the notion of a universal scaling law. And what we wanted to do was to see whether these two notions, the energy cascade and the universal scaling law, apply at all in active turbulence. And so to do this, I'll start again um, from the Navier-Stokes equations. And then the first thing that I will do is to get rid of inertia, because we said we were going to study flows at, growth, at, at low Reynolds number. Um, so we'll get rid of the left-hand side of this equation and replace it by a zero. Okay, here it is. And now, of course, we need to uh, make this equation active. We need to add active stresses to drive the flows. And I will add them in exactly the same way that I did in the previous part of the talk, okay? So we'll add this term, which is the divergence of some stress tensor related to the um, um, pneumatic order parameter tensor of this active liquid crystal that we'll be describing. And so this, as I said before, depends on the axis of alignment um, on the director field N. And now I need to write down an equation for the director field. Um, and so what I will do is to write down an equation that accounts for the fact that the director field is being advected by the flow, co-rotated by the vorticity of the flow. And then on the right-hand side, there's this term that tends to make the director field relax to a uniform configuration, okay? And this is due to the fact that there's some pneumatic elasticity that tends to, you know, um, um, give an energy penalty for distortions of a uniform orientation, okay? And so what's interesting is that in active liquid crystals, there's a competition between these active forces um, and these passive restoring forces. There's a driving and a restoring force, and the competition between them defines a length scale. This is this length scale here, which is often referred to as the active length. And um, the interesting thing is that in active liquid crystals, um, beyond this active length, there's an instability. There's a generic instability. And so let me discuss it. Imagine that we're um, considering the uniform state of uh, a liquid crystal in which the, all, all the components are aligned along the horizontal axis. And then we introduce a perturbation of this perfect alignment. Okay? We, we do a sinusoidal perturbation like illustrated here. So what will happen then is that the activity will generate flows that are such that they are like plotted here. And they are such that they will further amplify the initial perturbation that we imposed, okay? And so this means that there's an instability, and this means that then the system is able to flow spontaneously. It will start to flow spontaneously, powered by the distortions of the director field. And, um, and so this means that these um, systems can actually display um, spontaneous flows, and, and that's exactly what we want to study, right? So what we then did was to say, okay, let's simulate these equations. Um, and see the type of flows that we get right past the threshold of this instability. And so um, here's a snapshot of that. Um, that's the simulation. And what you can see is that the um, axis of alignment um, gets, you know, gets patterned over a length scale that is given by the size of the simulation box. That's what happens right past the threshold of the instability. And the corresponding flow field is a simple shear flow in which the upper half of the system flows left and the bottom half of the system flows right, okay? So simple shear and, and a pattern of the director field um, with the wavelength given by the size of the system. Now, as we increase the activity past the instability threshold, um, then this pattern itself becomes destabilized. And what we get is a pattern, a pattern of vortices and the associated domains of the director field, okay? Now, um, as we further increase the activity, it turns out that also this vortex pattern becomes destabilized. And in fact, there's a sequence of instabilities whereby these vortices break into smaller and smaller vortices. And then eventually at very high activities, we get something that looks like this, okay? And so this is a disordered pattern of orientation domains. 
and it is associated to the corresponding small vortices. So each of these little domains that you see would correspond to a little small vortex. And what's interesting is that now this pattern has an intrinsic wavelength. Okay, it has an intrinsic length scale, which is surprising because initially the initial instability did not give rise to an intrinsic wavelength. It gave rise to a pattern whose wavelength was dictated by the size of the system. But here, suddenly, when we go to the very nonlinear regime in, in, in at high activities, then we get patterns with intrinsic wavelengths. And this we can see, for example, by looking at the Frank energy, the spectrum of the Frank energy. The Frank energy is the energy associated to the distortions of the angle of alignment. Okay. And so um, this, um, th this is the, the spectrum of this um, free energy. And what we can see is that it's peaked at a characteristic wavelength, which is the size of these little domains. And this is now independent of the size of the system. As we change the size of the system, we always get the same spectrum of the Frank elastic energy, okay? So now in this turbulent state um, with these little vortices, the first thing that we asked is, is there an energy cascade? And so to, to do that, what we did was to compute the spectra of um, energy injection into the system by the active stresses. And so this is what's shown in the brown curve here. What you see is that there's energy being injected at all different scales, at all different values of the wave number, okay? But primarily energy is injected at this particular scale uh, that corresponds to the length scale uh, associated with the pattern, okay? That's exactly the length scale that I just introduced. Um, and so here's where most of the energy is being injected, but there's energy being injected at all different scales. Now, the interesting thing is what happens if we now compute the dissipation spectra. There are two sources of dissipation. There's shear dissipation as in any viscous fluid, and then there's rotational dissipation associated to changes in the axis of alignment. And um, when we add these two spectra up, they exactly compensate the energy injection spectrum at each Fourier mode separately, at each length scale separately, okay? And so this means that all of the energy that is being injected by activity at a particular length scale is being dissipated at that same length scale. And so this means that there's no energy left to be transferred to any other scale. And so there's no energy transfer at all. And therefore there's nothing like the energy cascade that we know in, in, in traditional turbulence, okay? So actually, we also have a way of showing this analytically. Uh, we have this expression for the spectrum of energy transfer between length scales. And um, it's given here in terms of the Fourier components of the alignment via this angle theta and uh, the flow field via this stream function psi. And what we can show analytically is that for the turbulent state, this expression vanishes because of symmetry reasons, okay? And so indeed, there is no energy transfer at all in this minimal simulation of an active um, turbulent system that we did. And so the emerging picture here is that the true difference between um, active and inertial turbulence is that in, in inertial turbulence, um, you externally impose the energy injection profile, right? You externally impose energy and you control how you do that. Here instead, in active turbulence, the energy injection process is the result of a self-organization process. It results from the coupling between, you know, um, the orientation, uh, the, the orientational degrees of freedom and the flow field. And, and this leads to some pattern of energy injection that is then exactly compensated with dissipation. And so this means that there can be turbulence without an energy cascade. Um, and so this is exactly what we observed in the simulations. Okay, so that's a main difference between um, passive and active turbulence. And so then the second thing that we wanted to know was whether, you know, now that we clarified the, the, the thing about the cascade, what we wanted to know is whether there's still a universal scaling law in active turbulence. So to, to look at this, what we did was to uh, look at the um, flow field. And so here you have a, a, a movie of the flow field in terms of the stream function. And what you can see is that despite there were these patterns of little vortices at some small scale, what we see in the flow field is that actually that there are these patches of correlated flow that happen over very, very large scales. And the, the size of these patches of flow is only limited by the size of the simulation box. Um, and so there are these, these are actually large scale circulations of flow, and they are due to the fact that there are long range hydrodynamic uh, interactions in the system. And so sure enough, if there are these patterns of large scale flow, they will have to uh, appear in the energy spectrum of the system. And so this would be the static picture. You have these large scale circulations on top of the small little vertices. And 
And if we look at the um, um, spectrum of the kinetic energy, the same thing that Kolmogorov predicted for, um, for classical turbulence, what we see is that um, there's a peak precisely at the characteristic length scale at which most of the energy is being injected. And then on either side of the peak, there are scaling laws, okay? The regimes characterized by power laws. And so uh, what we found at small scales is this Q to the minus four scaling, which had already been found by Luca Giomi before. And this characterizes what happens inside each of the small vertices. And so we, we uh, reproduced that. And then we were able to reach large enough simulation boxes to see what was going on at large scales. And so here, what we found is this scaling law that scales like Q to the minus one. And this is what plays you know, the role um, of, of the K to the minus five third scaling law by Kolmogorov, but now in active turbulence. And so the scaling law now has its own universal exponent, which is minus one. And we can actually um, argue at the value of this exponent. And the way we do it is by assuming that the correlations in the angle field, in the orientation field, are short ranged. And they are given by the characteristic line scale of the system, which is the active length. Okay. In Fourier space, this um, reads like this. It means that the um, you know the spectrum of the angular fluctuations is given by a Lorentzian-like function with a characteristic correlation length. And just by assuming that, we can then um, directly predict that the spectrum of the kinetic energy of these flows will scale like q to the minus one at large scales. Okay. So now the last thing that they want to say here is that uh, we then tested these predictions in experiments. And so to do this, we collaborated with uh, the lab of Francesc Sagues. And so Berta Martinez Prat there um, did um, experiments in which she makes a two-dimensional film of microtubules and kinesin molecular motors. And so this is an active pneumatic layer. And then she sandwiches this layer in between a layer of water below and a layer of oil on top. And so the nice thing about this experimental setup is that she can then um, tune the viscosity of the oil and thereby affect the flows in the active fluid. And so what we then did was to compute the spectra in this in these flows. And what we see is that in, in, in a number of different oil viscosities, we see these two scaling regimes that I was talking about, the Q to the minus four at small scales and the Q to the minus one at some intermediate scales. But then we had a surprise which is that at even larger scales, there's a new scaling law that emerges in the experiments. And it's this scaling law that um, you know, scales like Q to the one. And, um, and, and what we found is that this is actually due to the fact that there's dissipation going on in the oil. This is an external source of dissipation. And once we account for it, then we can actually also explain the Q to the one scaling law. And it's clear that this is due to the oil because if we go to extreme oil viscosities, then actually most of the spectrum is dominated by this new scaling law, okay? So that's what I wanted to say about the experiments. And um, so I just want to summarize the second part by saying that what we have found is that, um, you know, in active turbulence, we can have a, a turbulent, a chaotic state without an energy cascade. So that's a fundamental difference between active and, and classical turbulence. And um, yet, even if there's no energy cascade, um, the, the flows in, in active turbulence are still characterized by universal scaling laws with their own universal exponents. And, and so this is at least the similarity between um, classical and, and inertial turbulence, sorry, uh, between active and inertial turbulence. And um, so this, I think, clarifies this difference. And so that's all I wanted to say about this second part. So maybe that's another good time to pause for a moment and take any questions and then move to the third part. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you. It's really interesting. Look, the questions are flying in now. Everyone, you, everyone's got the bit between their teeth. So I'm going to go through them in order. Uh, um, there is, um, okay, so the first question, uh, in, in time, in time or chronological order as they came in, um, the first question was from Sammy Alizzi, who shouldn't technically be on this call uh, because he's been working so hard in lockdown. I told him to take a break, but he's joined anyway. Um, um, he says, do these scaling results depend on the dimension of the system? I'm assuming the simulations are done in 2D. Right, great question. Um, yes, they do. Um, indeed, the simulations are done in 2D. So what I said is for 2D, but actually since we have this argument to predict the, the, um, uh, the scaling exponents, we can also predict it in 3D. The prediction is that in the system that I was telling you about, which is um, you know, an active pneumatic in 3D, the scaling at large scales would be Q to the zero. So just a constant in the spectrum um, for a three-dimensional active pneumatic. Uh, 
that's the prediction. And of course, now, you know, it's up to uh, experimentalists to go and, and try to test this. And I think that there are experiments in bacterial colonies that are suggestive that this is the case. Um, so that's a, clearly a, a, an interesting direction for future work. Okay, uh, and then, uh, so I'll go down. There's a question again from Anthony. Uh, is there any threshold limit after which the intrinsic wavelength is attained by the system, like the condition uh, for instance? Uh, great question. Probably, I don't know. Um, so this is something that we didn't explore too much. We, we probed different values of the activity. And as we moved to higher and higher values of the activity, uh, we saw this you know, sequence of instabilities that ends up in a pattern with an intrinsic wavelength, but we didn't try to set the threshold for that. So that's something we would have to, to look into um, in more detail. I, I can't say by, at, at the moment. That's, that's an interesting question, thanks. And then there's two, two, two questions from Prasoon uh, Awasti. Uh, um, why was water used in the experimental setup? Why not oil in the bottom layer? And also what platform can I use for simulation to learn about active turbulence? Right. So um, they use water and oil because actually the, the microtubules um, are depleted toward a, a liquid liquid interface. So you need two immiscible liquids in order to form the layer in between them. So that's why you can use, you know, oil and water. Um, and, um, and then what platform for, for a simulation? Um, this, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I'm not sure what's the best. I used my own, uh, you know, code. Um, so I can certainly share it with you. I don't know if there's anything that would be much better. Um, we're also developing new code, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm happy to discuss this offline maybe if, if, if it helps. Okay. Um... Fantastic. Um, I actually have a quick question. I'm going to take sort of uh, um, uh, take my chances. Uh, uh, um, and I, I mean, I suppose I was just trying to reflect on what you just told us. And and as I see it, the the elastic modulus that the sort of one constant uh, approximation has quite a big part to play in selecting. Well, it does. It's, it's how you select the length scale. Um, and of course, that is that it's a storage modulus technically, right? And and in traditional right. turbulence. There's no such. There is no way to store potential energy, right? And, right? and 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 so I wonder how the removal. When you said k equals zero, I mean obviously you you then select no length scale. I would imagine that you just have uh, your your sort of bend spontaneous bend instability just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And smaller, and smaller. But right. what actually right. happens to the what happens in the energy cascade? I couldn't. That's the part I couldn't imagine what would happen if you if k is zero. How does that affect the energy cascade? Right. So this would mean that you are now uh, injecting most of the energy at some very, very small scale. Yeah. But in principle, you should also dissipate it at that same scale. Yeah. So I don't think there would be an energy cascade in, in, in that case. You would simply shift the peak that I was telling you about to really small scales and everything yeah. would be then all the action would happen there. But then, but do, and, but do you expect that you go like Q to the minus one all the way down to you know, as far as you can go. Yes, yes. In principle, the scaling regime could extend well uh, up to the up to yeah. the active length, and then you know, at, at even smaller length scales, you would find um, the the second scaling regime, the q to the minus four. Okay, okay. But you still yeah. expect the q to the minus four is sort of, I suppose, is, is I suppose the question. I, I I can't. I mean, without yes, I mean, without redoing the calculations, it's impossible for me to even imagine how how it all comes about. But. Uh, um, yeah. Right. Right. So in in the limit, the limit that you were saying is it would be a bit problematic because you you know you would um, send the length scale to infinity or yes, to exactly. rather to zero. So so you know you, you wouldn't be able to split two different scaling regimes. But you know the generic prediction is that above the active length scale, um, you get one scaling law, which is q to the minus one. Below yeah. it, you get the second scaling law, which is q to the minus four. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. 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 Okay. Fantastic. Um, Thank all right. You. Well, okay. Thank you very much for all of these um, super interesting questions. I'll now move to the final part of the talk. It, it should be fast. So um, what I'll discuss now is uh, the emergence of a, of a new um, phase separation mechanism in active fluids. And so this is work in collaboration with um, the lab of Steve Granick. And so Gia Zhang was actually responsible for the experiment. And again, I did the theory together with Ned Wingreen at Princeton. Um, and so what I want to discuss here is the notion of condensation. So it's, you know, a familiar uh, experience that um, gases can condense into liquids and therefore you can have 
a coexisting dense phase, the liquid droplets surrounded by a dilute gas phase. Um, so this is the phenomenon of liquid gas uh, coexistence. And um, we also all know, since the work of van der Waals in the 19th century, that this condensation, that this coexistence, is due to the attractive forces between the molecules of the fluid. Okay, they attract, and this allows these gas molecules to come together and form a liquid phase. Now, what I want to discuss here is the notion of condensation in active matter. And there has been a lot of work in the past um, decade or so showing that, in fact, in active matter, you can have condensation without attractive forces. And so the, the, you know, the framework to understand this is a minimal model called the repulsive active Brownian particles model. And so it goes like this. Imagine that you have a Brownian particle and it's self-propelled because it moves along a given axis n. And now I'm going to write down the equation of motion for this particle. So it's an overdamped system. So the velocity of this particle is given by its self-propulsion at the speed v naught and direction n. Then there are interaction forces with other particles. And I will assume that these are purely repulsive, so no attraction at all. And then there's noise, thermal noise, let's say. Okay. Now, of course, I also need to specify the dynamics of this axis of self-propulsion. And to do this, for simplicity, I will assume that it simply undergoes rotational diffusion. Okay. It's only subject to noise, rotational noise. And so this is the minimal model. And um, what happens is that in this minimal model, particles will from time to time collide head on. And as they collide head on, they will self trap for a while. They will stop each other for a while. And this is only gonna, you know, this, these particles are only gonna be able to move um, after they are able to reorient in a different direction, noisy, in a noisy way, and then, um, and then escape this, this sort of collision, okay? So if before this reorientation happens, there are other particles that come in and join the collision, they will make the cluster bigger and it will be even more difficult to escape um, this, this um, growing cluster. And so this, you can see that it leads to an instability whereby particles accumulate in clusters and this produces phase separation. And so this is what's known as motility induced phase separation. And it is due to this self-trapping effect. The fact that particles collide and slow down in dense regions and then they accumulate there. And so what we wanted to do was to um, sort of test this, um, this idea in a particular um, active matter system, which is artificial. It's made of um, synthetic Janus colloidal particles. And so these particles are made of glass. They are three microns in diameter. And uh, they are Janus because they have two faces. Uh, our experimental colleagues code one of the hemispheres in a metal. They use nickel. And then you can take a, a collection of these um, Janus colloidal particles and put them in a suspension and between two electrodes. And then you apply an electric field across these electrodes. And, um, and what this does is it induces electric dipoles in each of the hemispheres of these particles, okay? And the dipole in the metallic hemisphere will be stronger and of opposite sign than the dipole in the dielectric um, glass hemisphere. And so what happens is that this difference in electric dipoles induces a different ionic concentration around each of the hemispheres. And there are more ions here than there. So eventually the particles get pushed by this ionic concentration difference. And so this is a clever way of making self-propelled particles that will now move as we apply an electric field. And so um, this is how the system looks like. Each individual dot here is, is a single particle. And once we apply the electric field, we observe this. What you see is that these particles are condensing into clusters. Um, and, and they are these clusters of, you know, some dense phase are coexisting with the dilute surrounding gas phase of active particles. And so what I want to discuss now is um, the, how, how one of these clusters looks like. And before I show you how it looks like in our experiments, in our collaborators' experiments, I will show you how it looks like in some other experiments that were done in the group of Olivier Duchot in ex using exactly the same system, but at much higher self-propulsion speeds. And so in their case, the clusters look like this, okay? They are really dense, really jammed. The particles in the cluster are trapped in much the way that I was describing at the beginning. And so indeed, the self-trapping effect was causing phase separation in the system, okay? Particles uh, cannot move in these dense phases, and so they become stuck there, and that's what um, induces motility-induced phase separation. Now, what I'm going to show you is that in our system, at lower self-propulsion speeds, we have something that is really different. In our case, the clusters look like this, 
They are much less dense. And this is going to become a movie where we color coded the particles according to their initial distance from the center of the cluster. Okay. And as I play the movie, what you will realize is that the particles here are not self trapping. The, the cluster is not jammed. The particles can freely move through the cluster. They come in, they go out the cluster, they move through it. And so, you know, the, the question then becomes if it's not self trapping, if these particles are not jammed together, what is causing motility induced phase separation in the system? What is driving, what is the phase separation mechanism here? And so to answer this question, we again turn to theory. And so we'll consider the interactions between two of these particles as seen from the top. Okay. So this is the top view. We see the two particles with their own uh, um, hemispheres. And these particles are moving on the plane of the screen. And uh, the electric field is applied across the screen, okay, perpendicular to the screen. And so this induces dipoles as the ones that I just um, show. And um, these dipoles will then mediate electrostatic interactions between the particles. They will cause electrostatic interactions. And these uh, interactions are such that these particles will repel each other, okay? So that's good because we wanted to study, um, you know, um, phase separation in a system of repulsive particles. So indeed, here's our electrostatic repulsion. Now, the interesting thing though, is that because the dipoles in the uh, metallic hemispheres on the tail of the particle, are stronger than the dipoles in the dielectric hemispheres on the head of the particle, um, they will repel more, the tails will repel more than the heads. And as a result, um, these particles will experience not only a repulsive force, but also a torque, okay? These particles will tend to rotate to avoid, you know, to, to make the tails be as far as possible from one another. And so these particles will rotate um, toward one another, and once they face one another, then they will be able to self-propel, and this will allow them to move them close, closer um, um, despite repelling each other, okay? So these torques are actually the cause of phase separation in our system. It's not that the particles slow down at high densities, it's that they rotate toward high density regions. Um, and so, you know, I just gave away the main idea. So let me now encode it in, in equations. We can, of course, write down Langevin equations that describe this. This is exactly the same equation that I wrote before with self-propulsion, interaction forces, which are these electrostatic interactions uh, in our case, and noise. And then the dynamics of the axis of alignment, the dynamics of the self-propulsion direction includes now not only noise, but also torques, these electrostatic torques that are key, as I said, okay? Now, what we then did was to coarse grain this microscopic description and predict what are the collective forces and torques that a probe particle would experience within a sea of other particles, within a background of other particles, okay? And this is what I'm showing here. So let's try to understand these expressions for the um, collective force and the collective uh, torque. Imagine that we have a background of a given density of particles, okay? Let's start with a uniform density and we put a probe particle here in a given direction. And so if we look at these expressions, um, these terms here depend on density gradients and I'm considering a uniform density. So let's forget about this for the moment. The only contribution in a uniform density background is this first contribution, which is a force that is opposite, um, negative sign, opposite to the direction of self-propulsion. Okay, so this is because, this force is because um, particles that self-propel in a given direction will tend to encounter more particles in front of them. This is what's shown by this uh, G of R, this radial distribution function. A self-propelled particle will tend to encounter more particles in front than behind. And as a result, it will interact repulsively more strongly with particles in front than behind, and hence it gets pushed back. Okay, so this is the first contribution here. And this is what I call a repulsion induced slowdown because this force will tend to slow the particle down. And this force is exactly precisely the responsible of the traditional motility induced phase separation, which is, you know, the particles slow down because of this effect. Now, uh, what we have here is two additional forces. The first one is a force that goes with density gradient. So if we now consider a density gradient like this, now there are more particles on the right than on the left. And therefore, this particle will be pushed by repulsion toward smaller densities, okay? So this is like what happens in diffusion. Particles get pushed toward smaller densities. And um, so this is why I call this a repulsion-induced diffusion, okay? Now, finally, uh, these particles also interact via torques. 
And what I told you is that particles tend to rotate toward one another. And so this particle here will tend to rotate toward where there are more particles, meaning toward the right, okay, versus toward the left. So this particle here will, will tend to rotate toward the right. And so this is the role of this interaction torque. And um, this is what you can see in this expression too. This torque is making uh, the self-propulsion direction tend to align with the density gradient, okay? So just to show you that this is also observed in, in the experiment, um, what we show here is um, the background color shows the density of particles in a cluster. And so the density is maximal at the center and then it decays toward the periphery. And the arrows here are the velocity field of the particles. So particles are moving in a disordered way and the densest point is the center of the cluster. Now, if we now look at how particles are oriented, what we see is that they are all oriented inward, okay? In the direction of the density gradient. So that's consistent with the presence of these torques. And what I want to point out here is that also one of the interesting features is that um, the direction in which particles are oriented and the direction of their motion is not coincident in this system, right? Particles are oriented inward, but they move in all different directions. The velocity field is disordered, but the polarity field is very ordered, at least at the edge of the cluster, okay? Now, from this um, um, macroscopic description, what we then did was to predict the phase diagram. And so here's what we got. Uh, this is in terms of the self-propulsion speed and the density of particles. And so what we predict is that there's gonna be phase separation in this region of phase space, okay? And so indeed in the experiments, what we do is we observe phase separation precisely here as in the predictions, okay? And these predictions include both the effects of the torques and the slowdown, okay? So all, you know, what we already had in the traditional uh, motility induced phase separation, so the slowdown effect, but then additionally, the torques that I have introduced. And this is how we get this phase diagram. Now, to show that the torques are indeed crucial for phase separation in the system, what we did was to make the predictions without the torques. We pretend that they are not there and we predict phase separation. And so in that case, we get a phase diagram like this. We still predict phase separation, but only at much higher self-propulsion speeds and densities um, than observed in the experiments. So, you know, the experiments are in this um, bottom left corner. And if we forget about torques, we would only predict phase separation up here. Okay, so indeed to uh, predict what the experiments report, you need the torques. The torques are indeed what produce phase separation in the system. And so again, that's all I wanted to say. So let me just uh, summarize again by saying that what I've shown you is that um, torques are able to produce phase separation. So this is a new mechanism of phase separation that is not based on forces, not even attractive or repulsive, not even forces, um, um, torques, okay? And this um, phase separation based on torques allows for the formation of these clusters that emerge without self-trapping. So this allows the clusters to be fluid at very at relatively low densities. And you can have a coexistence between a, a, a liquid phase and a, and a gas phase with a fast turnover of particles between them. Um, and so maybe a more general message to end with um, is that what's interesting here is that orientational interactions um, which are these torques, right? Um, or interactions that change the particles' orientations um, lead to a coexistence between phases of matter, the dense and the dilute phase, that have no internal orientational order. They are isotropic phases. And, and this is surprising because usually when we think about orientational interactions, we think about alignment interactions that lead to magnetized phases or flocks of collective moving collectively moving individuals or, you know, phases of matter with orientational order. Here, what we have is that orientational interactions, these torques, lead to phases of matter without orientational order. So I think this is also a more generic uh, message that is, you know, interesting to point out. And so that's uh, all I wanted to say. And so thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to uh, more questions on this third part or, you know, on any of the previous parts of the talk. Thank you so much.